You're listening to Little Green Cheese, episode 67. Well, welcome back, Curd Nerds. I'm Gavin Webber, and this podcast is where you can learn about cheese making at home. So some of the things I've been up to lately is um, Kim and I went away for a relaxing weekend. Um, I recently had a hospital procedure where I was pumped full of intravenous drugs, um, namely methylprednisone, uh, which is an anti-inflammatory steroidal drug. Um, And this was to uh, get rid of the ongoing daily headaches that I've had for the past 18 months. Uh, which is one of the reasons why I haven't been recording the podcast. I made a conscious decision at the time when I was diagnosed with the condition New Daily Persistent Headache. Um, that's the name of the of the chronic head, headache disorder. I made a conscious decision that I was going to lighten my workload and something had to give uh, podcasts at the time, um, and this may be for selfish reasons, didn't make any money in the current format that I was recording them, but YouTube videos were making an income that I could survive on if I needed to basically go leave without pay from my normal work. So that's the reason I made the decision and I realised that uh, since then so many people have missed the podcast um, and I dare say they're all very happy to see it back again. Anyway, since uh, since we went away for that relaxing weekend, we tried quite a few different cheeses that I kind of hadn't sampled before. So we tried some locally produced washed rind cheeses. So very similar in style to, I would say, Tilsit that I've made before. Um, so nice orangey red um, rind. You can see that the paste itself is soft uh, and it has that... Um, unusually smooth but deep complex flavour that we're used to when you make a a rind ripened or rind washed uh, cheese using Brevi bacterial linens. So we tried some of that. Also I tried a a triple cream um, brie style. It wasn't brie at all because uh, for those who know what real brie looks like, it's rather large. It's about 20 centimetres across, and it's about two inches high, um, which is, what, 10 centimetres? Um, no, not 10 centimetres, five centimetres high. Uh, so it didn't look anything like a brie. If anything, it would be a petite brie. Anyway, triple cream, the fat content was really high. As long as with those sorts of cheeses, you let them come up to room temperature before you try them, uh, because cold straight out of the fridge, they are tasteless, basically. It's not until they've warmed up a little bit that the full flavours and complexity of those sort of triple cream, really creamy cheeses um, are evident. Anyway, so we tried some of that. And I also tried to get my hands on a cheddar that was smoked using apple wood. So I managed to get hold of something that had been imported from England. Um, It was made in the Somerset area. So I think it was legitimate cheddar. Um, Yeah, smoked with apple wood and it really did taste amazing. So um, when I do start cold smoking um, some of my cheeses, I'll try and get some apple wood chips and, uh, and use that to cold smoke the cheese. Anyway, let's move along. I've got some interesting news to share with you. So recently, one of my daughters uh, got engaged, and that's my daughter, Megan, who's the youngest daughter that I have. Uh, She is... I won't tell you her age because that's not not what I should do. But anyway, she, instead of um, at the engagement party, instead of having a cake or something like that, she's basically going to have a cheese tower. Now, I just recently read an article from, um, what's this, Elite Daily. I think it's a blog, a a well-known blog. 
Um, and it says that uh, Murray's Cheese in New York City offers cheese towers instead of wedding cakes. Now, those who don't know or are not familiar, Murray's is one of the largest well-known cheesemongers in New York City, and they hold a very large range of artisan cheeses um, throughout the world. So I'll read a bit of this. This is from uh, Candice uh, Jalali. I think that's how you pronounce her last name. It says, I've got to be honest, I'm not really a huge cake person. I think the main issue is that I'm not big into sweets uh, in general, so cake never seemed to appeal to me. As a result, the whole wedding cake thing never seemed that exciting to me. That being said, as the niece of a cheese factory owner, I'm a huge fan of cheese. And now it looks like I can integrate my love of the cheesecake into my wedding reception. How, you ask? Well, Murray's Cheese in New York City offers cheese towers that you can have at your wedding in lieu of a more traditional wedding cake. Anyway, it goes on a lot about uh, cheesecake, so you can check those out in the uh, show notes. I'll put a link to the article. Anyway, getting back to my daughter's engagement, uh, at her engagement party, she's going to have a cheese tower. Now, she did ask me... <laughs> And she asked me four weeks before the event, Dad, can you make lots of cheese for a cheese tower? Uh, which to I promptly said no, uh, because good cheese takes time, as we all know. Um, so the only cheese that I could come up with in a short amount of time would be a fairly um, oh, decent size. It'd be about 165 millimetres across, 16 inches. What's that? Six, sorry, 16 and a half centimetres, which would be about six inches across the top. So I'm going to make a couple of cheeses, queso fresco style, one with chilies in it and one with cranberries in it. And she's going to use those as tiers for her cheese tower uh, for her engagement party, which uh, will be held early next month. So I'm very excited about that. So that's the bit of news. And I have seen other places making cheese towers as well. Um, here in Australia, there are a few uh, cheesemongers that are doing it as well. So that's great news. Cheese cake made out of cheese, not a cheesecake, made out of cream cheese, um, that people can cut into and get different styles of cheese. I think that's absolutely inventive and very, very clever. Okay, uh, the for the questions. I've got questions. I've always got questions. So the first question is from John, and it's about renting, I believe. Hello, Gavin. John from Denmark. I have a question regarding rented amount of rented and the resting time to get a clean break. Let's say I have a recipe telling me to use two milliliter rennet and a resting time for 45 minutes. If I don't have a clean break, what should I do? Extend the time or use more rennet? I would like to get some information regarding that. Thank you very much, Gavin. I'm happy you are here. All the best to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, John. And John is from Denmark. Uh, he's uh, been on the podcast a few times before. So thank you very much, John, for your question. Yes, about renting. There is um, a standard rule of thumb that if your your milk hasn't set within the first 40-odd minutes um, or started to set anyway, then you should leave it for at least 10 to 15 minutes. Now, there is a way of determining how long your cheese needs to set depending on the cheese type. Now, just let me get that up and I'll just read a little bit about it. I wrote a, a blog post uh, on littlegreencheese.com about flocculation. Yes, it's not a dirty word. It's flocculation. So flocculation is um, a method for determining when your curd can set. Oh, sorry, when, you, when your curd's ready to be cut, so basically. So 
Uh, the flo flocculation method, I'm just reading from my blog post now. The flocculation method for a better curd is the way to test the point of coagulation after adding the rennet to your milk. Using a factor, depending on, on, depending on the type of cheese you are making, you multi multiply the time taken for the flocculation point to help you predict the best time for curd set. So here's the process. So you add your rennet when the recipe states it uh, to the strength that it states it. Uh, you start a timer so you know how many minutes have elapsed. Uh, you leave the milk for five minutes. Then you take a very small sterilized plastic bowl and place it on the surface. It should float, obviously. Uh, then spin the bowl gently whereby it should rotate freely. Do this every minute or two. Now you should notice at around about the eight minute mark that you find that it's slight, there's some slight resistance from the milk and uh, test then spinning the little plastic bowl about every 30 seconds. Now between 10 and 15 minutes, the bowl should become stuck, uh, indicating that the curd mass has formed. This is the flocculation point. Now it may take longer, so don't panic. Keep testing the curds until they set and the little bowl doesn't spin anymore. Now, once set, set, don't try and spin the bowl anymore. Just gently remove it from the surface of the curds and note the time elapsed. Okay, so now you've got the flocculation point. You need to then multiply it by the time that it took uh, for the curd mass to set by a figure in a table below. Now, what I'll do... I will put this into the show notes, uh, the flocculation time. So for various types of cheeses, so I'll give an example. So for alpine style cheeses, uh, you multiply the, the flocculation point by two. For a cow's milk cheddar, 2.5. For something like a filly, 3.5. For feta and blue cheeses, four is the multiplication factor. And camembert and brie, five to six. So on the higher side. So um, very simple, the blog post there, I'll put that into uh, the show notes. I'll just put that in right now. I'm doing this all on the fly. This is all very exciting. <laughs> all right, so that's in there, flocculation for a better curd. So that's how you do it, John. Um, when in doubt, uh, wait a little bit longer if you don't think that uh, the curd's able to uh, be cut. Use the clean break test, which is basically either putting your finger or a sharp knife into the curd, turning it a little bit, and then lifting it up. And if it breaks cleanly along a line, then you know that it's set. Never add more rennet to the cheese uh, because it is still trying to coagulate, even though you think it, it may be taking longer time. Anyway, thanks for your question, John. Um, I appreciate it. And sorry, it's taken me so long to get to it. The next question is from Saul. Hey, Gavin. How's it going? My name's Paul Ochoa. Uh, I'm from the United States, but I love watching all your videos. Recently, I started making a few cheeses, but I've noticed that they end up turning out a little bit sour. I'm not quite sure why that might be. I figured maybe I'm using too much culture. culture I'm not sure, but... The ending product ends up being a little bit sour, and it ranges from anything being from a queso fresco to a queso cotija. The cheese ends up coming out just a tad bit sour, so I was just wanting to know if you could help me out with that. Thank you. Sure, Saul, no problems at all. Um, I think I've got a solution for you. I think you could probably cut back a little bit on the rennet and subsequently cut back a little bit on calcium chloride if you're using it at all. If you taste calcium chloride, and I suggest you do, just put a little bit on your finger and um, and try that, you will find that it is quite bitter. Um, so adding too much of that and too much rennet, you will find that uh, it tends to make any cheese, even a fresh cheese, uh, a little bit bitter or sour. Also, it could be slightly too much rennet. So have a look at the manufacturer's advice on how much, um, sorry, starter culture, how much starter culture to add for the amount of milk that you're using. Uh, a lot of recipes will 
recommend a lot higher doses. Um, I tend to add, I, I err on the side of caution, I add a little bit less, um, usually for the 8 to 10 litres of milk that I use. Um, most recipes will say in the books that I've got a quarter of a teaspoon, whereas I will rarely add any more than an eighth of a teaspoon. And that's because the manufacturer, I use uh, Sacco cultures, which is about all I can get here in Australia, which are made in Italy and imported in. They tend to be on the stronger side than, say, something like a Danisco uh, Choose It culture, uh, which tends to be on the higher dose side. So there's some variables you can um, play with there, Saul, and hopefully that answers your question. The next question is from Henry. Hello, Gavin. I am Henry from Finland, and I have a question about cheddar cheese. I have made three cheddars so far, but all of those cheddars taste too acid for me. What I am doing wrong? Uh, can I wash the curd before I do the cheddaring process? I really love sharp cheddar, long-aged ones, but my cheddar is way too far about what I'm looking for. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Henry, thank you very much. And I won't make any jokes about the hydraulic press channel because you actually sound just like that guy from YouTube. But moving on with cheese. Henry, I believe your problem may stem, stem from um, too much starter culture and that's what it will tend to acidify the cheese too quickly um, because there is so much culture in there. So... What I suggest is to use a little bit less starter culture um, than what you're normal that you normally use, um, and it could be the culture you're getting um, hold of there. You only need a minute amount. Um, you could wash the curds beforehand, um, so you could throw a step in there yourself if you tend to not like your the cheese that you're making um, and it's too strong. What you could do is temper it a little bit using. The method that we use in cheeses that come from um, uh, the Netherlands, like uh, Edam and uh, Gouda or Gouda, those cheeses there get their, their curds washed. So after you've stirred the curd, um, basically, sorry, after you've cut the curd and stirred it for about 20 minutes, then basically withdraw, take all the, let it rest for a few minutes, let, let the, um, the curd sink to the bottom of the pot, take off most of the whey down to the level of curds and then replace it with warm water. I wouldn't use water any hotter than, say, 60 degrees Celsius. So when you put the water into the curds, then the resultant temperature should be around about 38 degrees Celsius. Uh, and then wash your curds for about between 15 and 20 minutes and then start the cheddaring process. Um, you'll find you get a much, much milder cheese it won't be cheddar anymore. It will be something else, but I dare say it would taste quite delightful. So it'll be a, a cross between cheddar and something else. So there's a brand new cheese that is created on the podcast just for you, Henry. So that would help you with any um, sharpness or, um, or really strong cheese that you're currently making. Anyway, I hope that answers your question, Henry. The next question is from Jerry. Hi Gavin, my name's Jerry. I was just wondering if, uh, in terms of cheese salt, if I could use a really fine uh, pink Himalayan salt. It's not a flaky one, it is just kind of a, a sort of a bitsy one. Um, yeah, all right, thank you. Uh, Jerry, thanks for your question. And you sound like you're from Australia, which is cool. Uh, I don't get many questions from Australia of all places, seeing that's where I'm based. In answer to your question, yes, you can use fine pink Himalayan salt. However, that may turn your cheese a little bit pink uh, if you're looking for, a, say, a white look of uh, cheese or a yellow look, it'll go slightly pink. However, that may also inhibit your, uh, during, sorry, during maturation, sometimes cheeses, if they're too moist, they turn pink and that may cause a problem for you if you use pink salt. However, the minerals in the pink salt, they don't contain iodine. They're usually very pure salts. Um, I use them myself. I have them in the uh, in our salt mill um, that we put salt and pepper on our dinners and meals. So it's no problems at all. It's good salt, lots of minerals in it. Um, you can use it. 
However, because it tends to be very fine and cheese salt tends to be a little bit on the coarser side and have bigger granules, I would ease off probably about 10% less salt um, in uh, using pink Himalayan salt, 10% less than you would normally use if you had a coarser cheese salt. So that's my advice to you. Hopefully that will work out and uh, I'd love to see some photos of a pink cheese <laughs> using your uh, pink salt. So thank you very much, Jerry. Well, that's all we've got time for this week. Thanks very much for listening, everybody. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on the player of your choice so that you get informed each and every week uh, when you get a new podcast episode. Also, don't forget to pop over to my YouTube channel, which is cheeseman.tv. Uh, if you type that link into your uh, browser, you'll be whisked away to my YouTube channel where you can also subscribe and get notified of any new content that I release. I usually release two videos a week, one live stream on a Wednesday and a how-to video, um, usually Friday mornings here Australia time, which is, what's that, Thursday afternoon-ish um, in the US. You've been listening to Little Green Cheese Podcast. For upcoming workshop dates, you can find them over at littlegreencheese.com. You can also find my ebook, Keep Calm and Make Cheese, The Beginner's Guide to Cheese Making at Home, which is available in all good ebook retailers. You can find my cheese making videos over at cheeseman.tv, uh, which will whisk you away to my YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe there. You can also support the show by supporting via Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash greeningofgavin. Any donation would be graciously accepted. Thanks for listening, Curd Nerds, and stay tuned for another episode of the Little Green Cheese podcast. During this podcast, you heard royalty-free music by Kevin McLeod. I played Malt Shop Bop, News Theme, and Call to the Dairy Cows. Ah.